Hey, Liu Yang. Is is Chengdong in? Is Chengdong logging yet? Uh, not yet. I I sent a reminder to him just now. Okay, good, good. Maybe send him that 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 PDF file again. Now huh? it's okay. also password protected, right? <laughs> yeah, he does send the whole. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All good. Okay. Uh, Prof Su, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Who's okay. uh, who's speaking? Uh, Yang. Yang, yeah, this is Yang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's let's. I think uh, uh, I will do a quick introduction, and then you can share the screen uh, to start. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, maybe let's wait for uh, three more minutes, then we can start. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, hi Chengdong. Thanks again for uh, for your support. I guess it must be early morning in uh, Zurich. Hi Jinsong. Uh, no, it's it's all right. It's, uh, it's 10, uh, 10, 10 a.m. So that's not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Yes. Uh, yeah, and also there's a beautiful snow outside. Ah, cool. <laughs> yeah, we just had the first snow. Really? Okay. I yeah, yeah, that. first snow mm -hmm. just uh, uh, I think two days ago. Okay. It was a big snow. All right. So the ski season must start even earlier, right? From the mountain, since always. Yeah, open. I guess. Uh, I guess you know, uh, some people are probably are very happy now. Yeah, but the uh, the COVID situation is not great here. Oh yeah, that's right. So the the, the ski resort open or are they all closed because of COVID? I think there's a discussion about the policies they're going to have this year. It's not clear. Yeah. So mm. I guess I don't follow that very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're just trying to hide at home most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. I mean, while you do ski, usually people wearing kind of a helmet and, and if you can yeah. wearing a mask, I guess it's all, right. all, yeah. all good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's nice and warm in Singapore, yeah. Always, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I swim yeah. every day now. Mm. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> but still put on other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Here outside is like a, it's a, like a freezing temperature. Yeah. yeah. Next time we get you here for a summer vacation. <laughs> yeah, and I think I mean you 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 folks should also come here to visit. You know, it's a uh, we should, yeah, we we'll go for a ski trip. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I leave Yang to uh, share, share your session. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think let's uh, let's start. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, uh, Prof Su. And uh, I think we we'll welcome everyone for this uh, the keynote session, the second day of AppSec Twenty Twenty. I think today the speaker is uh, Professor Zhen Dongsu, uh, who is a full professor in computer science at the ETH Zurich. And previously he was a professor and the chancellor's fellow uh, at UC Davis. So he received his PhD in UC Berkeley and his research really uh, spanning from uh, various topics from uh, programming language, compiler, software engineering, 
computer security, deep learning, and now to the education technologies. Uh, his work has been recognized by numerous prestigious awards, some like uh, ACM's uh, Six of Impact Paper Award, uh, Google Scholar uh, uh, Classic Paper Award, and multiple uh, distinguished distingu paper and best paper award at top venues like um, PLDI, uh, OSDA, Uppsala, ICSI. And the uh, ACM, ACM Research Highlights NSF Career Award, um, UC Davis Outstanding Faculty Award, and many other industrial awards. I think there are too many to, to, to name. Uh, uh, he's, he also served on the steering committee of ISTA and FSE, served as uh, associate editor uh, for TOSUM, uh, co chaired mm -hmm. SAS 2009, program chaired uh, uh, ISTA 2012, and program co chaired uh, FSE uh, uh, 2016. Uh, I think beyond all this um, award, I think his research also makes significant reward impact. If I'm not wrong, uh, Prof. Su's uh, uh, research has led to many critical bugs uh, found in the uh, major. Uh, commercial and widely used software systems. I think ranging from uh, compilers, uh, from SMT solvers, and even to the uh, uh, database management system. And the, the number of bugs found is not just a hundred, but now it's close to thousands of these critical bugs. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Prof. Su to give this very exciting to uh, topic. Yeah, Prof. Su, please. Okay, thanks, Yang, for the very kind introduction, and also for everyone for the uh, for the organizers for the invitation. So let's let me set up the screen first before I continue. So. so I think I should have shared the screen. Is that correct? Just want to double check. Yes. Okay, again, yeah, thanks, uh, Yang, for the very kind introduction. And uh, so, and so I just want to show a very nice picture of Switzerland. Hope uh, the COVID situation will get better soon. Everyone are welcome to come here to visit the beautiful Switzerland. And of course, also hope we all can travel to all the beautiful places in the world very soon. So the topic of the talk I'm going to give is solidifying the software foundations. And I'm going to use this talk to share some of the work my group has done over the last many years and also to share some of my, my perspectives on, on this particular problem. So uh, let me start to ask a question and to everyone that is, you know, we all work in computer science and for us here is we all work in like uh, the software related fields. And the question is for us as a computer scientist, what's the key mission of computer science? And many of us may have different answers. And here's my answer. And our goal should be to help people turn their creative ideas into working systems. So that should be really the key mission of computer science. And in particular, and the software, software research kind of like that's dear to our hearts and that's cent central to this particular mission of computer science. And uh, so now let's reflect upon this question to help people turn creative ideas into working systems. So I stress on this working. And uh, in order to build working systems, that means the system should be working correctly as expected, what the user uh, intend. And uh, so in order to do that, I argue that we need to have very solid foundations, in particular software foundations, and that will include many things, ranging from compilers that people use to build their software, databases that for storing and retrieving data, operating systems that runs all the programs that we write, and you know, also crypto libraries, OpenSSL, to make sure that we access the websites, everything securely. And also things like more foundational theorem provers, that can help us to make sure even all the other softwares are working correctly. So I argue that building solid software foundations, that's key to help people to build working systems. So I want to use three stories, three very simple stories to highlight the importance of doing so. And I'll, uh, in particular, some experience that we have on uh, validating compilers, database engines, and also SMT solvers more recently. Okay. 
And these are critical software foundations. And uh, because anyone who fails, I mean, the softwares that we build that are on top of them are not going to work correctly as expected. So let me start with, uh, with uh, you know, our work on validating production compilers. And this work started about uh, six or seven years ago. And uh, so at this point uh, that we have, uh, uh, you know, built a set of techniques that have been used to find more than 600 bugs in the most of why you see C++ compilers like GCC and Clan LLVM. So let me start uh, by uh, arguing that compilers are very complex software systems. And we know they're very important, they're foundational software that we use to build other software systems. And uh, so we all know that Linux that uh, most of us, a lot of us use is very complex. And uh, so this, the numbers here are from a few years ago. And so Linux code base has close to 20 million lines of code a few years ago. And the recent number says it's close to 30 million lines of code. And uh, so the GCC code base, many of us probably are not expecting to be this big. And actually the GCC code base is also very complex, very close to the Linux code base. So that's at a few years ago at 15 million lines of code. And LLVM is a modern C and C++ compiler infrastructure. And at that point a few years ago was a few million lines of C++ code mostly. So these numbers clearly show compilers like GCC and LVM very, very complex. And when, once we have a complex system and they're critical and we, because we build our softwares uh, on top of them and uh, we need to make sure they're reliable. And uh, so the question is how reliable are they? And let me start with by illustrating what sort of uh, issues that can happen with a compiler. So, in particular, let's look at this uh, very simple piece of code. It doesn't do very much. And we have, a, we have a struct that contains three character fields, C, D, and E. And we have a function foo that checks whether the C field is one or not. If it's not, we abort and check also the E field to see whether it's one or not. If it's not, then we abort. And in the main function, it declares this local uh, struct S and then initialize all the variables to be one, and then we invoke foo on s. And as expected, this piece of code should just return normally without triggering the aborts, because c and e here are all one. And if we compile this using the client, com client compiler, client LVM compiler, and without turning any optimizations on, and the binary works as expected. But if we turn this, if we use minus 01, that means we just turn on you know, a, a subset of the optimizations that, uh, because most of us use uh, like at dash 02. And, and the binary give us a core dump and that's unexpected. Right? And, that's, and this is a typical compiler bug and that's called a wrong code bug or miscompilation. And this is a scary type of bug because, because the compiler is able to produce the code correctly and the binary is not working as expected. So this is a silent compiler bug. And uh, so this was a real bug in a uh, client L LVM and uh, it took uh, the, uh, the, uh, the LVM developers quite a long time to figure out what's going on. And the developer added this comment. It says, very, very concerning when I got to the root cause and very annoying to fix. And uh, so it took uh, about a couple months to have this bug fixed. So now we know that compilers are very important. Compilers are very complex. So how do we find bugs like the one I have shown you? And so that we can uh, you know, make, uh, make sure that our users are not going to be affected by these bugs. Uh, so here's our uh, starting idea to think about this problem. That is, we have a lot of C and C++ programs out there already. People have written, for example, you know, people put on GitHub. And if we can take a, take a program that uh, is already written by people, if there is a way we can manufacture from this program P many variants of program P such that they are different, they look different, but functionally equivalent to the original program, semantic equivalent to the original program. Then all these variants could be used to stress, stress test a compiler. So that's the idea. But let's look this idea 
deeper, right? So there are some important challenges we have to overcome somehow to make this idea into, a, uh, you know, into reality. The first thing is generation. That is, how do we generate different and equivalent tests program out of P? The second thing is, once we generate such a program, how do we make sure it's indeed semantic equivalent to the original program? And these two questions are both are longstanding hard issues in, in programming language compilers and software engineering. So it seems like we have hitting a wall right now. So the question is, then how are, how are we going to make a breakthrough so that uh, we'll be able to uh, take this idea and make a realistic realization of it? And here is uh, our view of this. And uh, actually, I, after quite a long time thinking about this problem, and uh, for the classical program equivalence, is it defined as follows: If we have two programs P and Q, they are semantic equivalent if for all input i, and uh, running P, running program P on this i and running program Q on this i, they should give us exactly the same result on all inputs i. So that's a classical definition of program equivalence. So our insight was, let's relax this definition. So we introduced this notion called equivalence modulo inputs, EMI. That is, we don't care about all the inputs. Let's fix one input I. So we define that P is equivalent to Q with respect to this input I, if and only if on this I, P and Q give us the same result. And that's why it's called equivalence modulo input in EMI. And uh, this is a very simple realization of the program equivalence. And uh, so at this point, it may not be clear to people I mean, how this could be used in a way that to find, uh, to test compilers. So at a high level, this idea of EMI exploits this close interplay between two things. One is running a program P or Q on this input I is very simple. But in order to, to compile P or Q, correctly on all possible inputs, and that's very hard. So compilers are doing a very hard job. But running a program P on a particular input I is very simple. So in a sense, we're trying to play some games with the compiler, try to fool the compiler. And here's how we're going to do it. And we take a program P, that's our seed program, and we take the input I, that's the equivalent modular input, we, we focus on this particular input I, we run the program P on this input I, and we prove how to run. And all the green nodes are the ones that are going to be executed for this particular run, and the red nodes are the, are the ones not executed. And also we record the particular output of running program P on I. So now we have this information. It's very easy to get. We can use, for example, coverage tools like GCOV to get this information. Once we have this information, we can keep all the green nodes here, the ones that are executed intact. We don't change any of this. And, but for the red nodes, which are not uh, executed, we can do a lot of things. In particular, we can drop something. We can insert some you know, additional statements or we can you know, do both. And uh, one thing that's interesting, but all this invariance, if we're running all these variants on the same input I, they're guaranteed to produce the same output O as the original program P because we did not change all, any of the executed statements. So these variants are equivalent modulo I. So now we have produced a lot of variants. You see, how do we use this to find bugs in compilers? And here's a very simple thing that we can do next. That is, if we produce a variant and on this variant, on the same input i, if output O prime is different from the original output O, then we know we have found a bug. And this is guaranteed. Okay? If we run into a situation, we guarantee we have found a bug in the compiler. Okay? So that's a very simple idea, very basic idea, and also is widely applicable to many settings. And now let's go back to re revisit the challenges that we have. And now generation becomes very easy, right? We just prove how the program run and just randomly deleting or inserting some statements into the program. And the validation is also very easy because we take a variant and just run the program, compile the program and run it on the same input I and observe the output. 
if the outputs are the same, that's great. If the outputs are different, we know we have found a bug. So the generation problem and validation problem all became very easy now in this particular setting. So now let's see how do we use this idea to find the bug I have shown you earlier. See, so that's this particular bug. And we start here with a seed program, that's the program P, and it's taken from the GCC test suite. And on this original program, it's not very big. And if we compile this with clan dash O zero, it works correctly as expected. Dash O one, it also works correctly as expected. So we run this program, we pull files run, we notice that all these abort statements are not executed. Then through our idea, we'll be able to produce a variant with some of these abort statements deleted. Once we have done that, and you see this transform program, now if we compile this at dash 01 in the binary core dumps, and we have triggered a compiler bug. And again, this is a guarantee. We have a test case that illustrates that clan LVM has this miscompilation or wrong code bug. Okay. Now let's look at this deeper. How come you know, we have this bug? So once we have this test case here, you can imagine in this case, the test case is very small, but you can imagine the test case can be very long, maybe thousands of files long. So before we report this to the developers, typically we want to go through a process called test, put, test input reduction. We want to make the test cases as small as possible that still triggers the same bug and then report the smaller test cases to the developers. So the one we reported is as, after test case reduction. Okay. Now let's try to understand how come client LLVM miscompiled this piece of code. So in particular, what has happened is uh, there is a particular analysis within the compiler called GVN, global value numbering. And we don't need to know the details. It's really just one of these, a few hundred, you know, like a little algorithms behind typical compilers. And uh, so this particular optimization pass and uh, analyze the code and it says, here, now you're loading this struct S into this uh, uh, like a formal parameter X, and that's doing three character loads. Load the character C and D and E. So that's three loads. And it says, why don't we do something smarter? Why don't we turn these three character loads into a 132-bit integer load? So GVN, that's analysis, decides that's something good to do because we reduce three loads to one load. And then there's another particular a little algorithm called SROA, scalar replacement of aggregates. And then it says, mm -hmm, something is not quite right because now is, uh, the struct only has three character fields, right? That's 24 bytes, I mean 24 bits. And now we have a integer load that's 32 bits and you're reading past the struct's end. And then that means, because if you do that, that's undefined behavior in the, in the program. So the program here does not have any undefined behavior. It's, it's valid, but it's a mistake made by the compiler, right? Because GVN decides we want to change the three character loads into a 32-bit integer loads, and then this particular pass decides then the code has undefined behavior. It's a mistake made by the compiler. And then once the compiler views that the code is undefined, then the compiler is, can do anything with the code. In particular, the compiler decides to remove this here, the three initializations. And we know that in C and C++ code, local variables are uninitialized. They contain random garbage. And in particular, they may consider the values that the C and E are not equal to one and then the boss is triggered. So that's an interesting combination of the interplay between two passes, GVN and SROA. So that's quite interesting. So here's the question I leave for, 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 for the audience to think about. In the seed program, it did not trigger a bug in clan LLVM. But after, you know, after we remove few aborts, somehow it triggered the bug. And what's the reason? So I'm not going to give the answer here, just uh, something interesting for you to ponder over. And let's look at another issue, and that comes from GCC. And uh, this piece of code, and uh, so I just want to remind everyone, in C and C++ code, if all global variables are initialized to zero, they're different from local variables. So that means A, B, C, D, E, they're all zeros. And then we have an outer loop that iterates through 
the B a bunch of times, and then the inner loop here C, the condition here C, because zero, that means these are not going to be executed, this part. Okay, so that means the loop are going to iterate, iterate a bunch of times and then terminate. So GCC compiled with dash O zero and works as expected, dash O three and the binary hands runs into an infinite loop. So again, that's a, that's a real compiler bug. It's a miscompilation by GCC. So what has happened here? Let's uh, just spend a bit of time looking into this. So in particular, the compiler decides that this expression is interesting because the B is not modified within the loop, then that's called a looping variant. Uh, for looping variant, we don't want to keep that in within the loop. We want to ho hoist this outside doing a looping variant motion. So we change this to be outside of the inner loop here. And once that has done, something bad has happened because when B is equal to one, and this is already the largest a positive sign integer. And then for B is equal to minus one, we add one to it, we have a sign integer overflow. And sign integer overflow is undefined behavior in C++, uh, in C and C++. So the compiler decides the code has undefined behavior. And then once the compiler decides the code has undefined behavior, again, it's a mistake by, made by GCC here, that it can do whatever to the code. In particular, just turn this code into an infinite loop. Okay, so. So that's another instance of bug and to see, and in the seed program, and we had a B plus plus. So in this case, because B is mod modified, the expression here is not a, a looping variant anymore and no longer can be hoist. So that's why in the original seed, the bug was not triggered. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And that was uh, uh, the work that we have done in 2014 was published, uh, uh, was uh, the work of Orion and it's doing something very simple. It will only just, uh, uh, getting rid of dead code randomly, only removing. And then we, uh, in a sequence of work, we find the basic technique. And uh, in the uh, follow-up work, we only, not only delete it, but also we inject additional code. And uh, for the, the, the Hermes work, we, we, we try to be more ambitious. It says, let's not only touch the dead code regions, but also look at the live code regions, just to make sure that still the a mutated variant on the same input I still behaves the same as the original program. Okay. And uh, so after a few years, about five or six years of extensive testing, continual testing of GCC and LVM, we have uh, reported more than 1600 bugs and now the number is even higher. And uh, uh, this number is usually more interesting. How many bugs that, uh, that got fixed? And it's more than a thousand already got fixed. And also with some additional follow-up work that we have done. Okay. And also the community, uh, we really appreciate kind of the, 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 the acknowledgement from the community so that they, you know, LVM in their release notes acknowledge our effort and also uh, GCC add, you know, added us to their list of contributors. Okay. So that's uh, one part of the story. That is, I mean, how to develop a simple technique that works very effectively to find uh, series box in production compilers that all of us use on a daily basis, perhaps. So that's the first story. And now let's go to the second story. That is, how do we uh, test database engines? And, uh, you know, I think mo many of us, most of us are familiar with this database system, SQLite, MySQL, and so on, Post, uh, Postgres SQL. And uh, SQLite, is uh, this is one of the most like widely used uh, database systems ever. Yeah. So it has over one trillion SQLite databases in active use for SQLite. And then MySQL is the most popular open source database management system. Okay, and also this uh, newer kind of like uh, uh, players in, the, in this domain and these are highly popular commercially developed database management systems with like uh, you know, around 20,000 stars on GitHub. Okay, so also, uh, you know, database managed systems also extensively being tested, okay, because they're important, right? They're, we use database managed system to store important data and also uh, to retrieve, uh, storing and retrieving important data. So SQLite is very impressive in a sense, has more than 600 times as much test code as source code. And that's super impressive if you think about this, right? So that means 
is every line of code, you have six, more than 600 lines of testing code. And the SQLite test cases achieve 100% branch test coverage. Again, if we think about testing, right? And that's just amazing. You know, how could you achieve, you know, 100% even like statement coverage? And also SQLite extensively fuzzed, for example, by the Google's uh, OS fuzz project. And also, you know, it's like uh, doing a lot of like anomaly testing as well, right? So for example, in terms of IO failure and power failures. So the point is that, you know, database managed system, because they're critical, they're being heavily tested already. So our goal here is a little different from the previous work. And our goal is try to say similar to the miscompilations in compilers, we want to find logical bugs. That is, we have a SQL query and we want to know the result we get from the SQL query is indeed the right result. And that can be very difficult because you can imagine a database uh, contains millions of records, right? How do we know that the database is really is producing the right result? So it's a very hard question. So here is a concrete SQLite bug. And uh, so let me just illustrate this. Let's focus our attention. So the table contains uh, these uh, four rows, okay, zero, one, two, and null. And here is a select query, select zero from T0 world this, so that's the select uh, uh, the query. And is not here, just want to maybe, you know, you know some of you folks are not familiar with uh, SQL. So is not is a null safe comparison operator. That means this can be applied safely to null if the, if the content here is the common value is null. Okay, so let's look at this query in a bit more depth. So if it's a zero, zero certainly is not one, so that's true, so zero should be returned. And uh, one is not one, that should be false. So one is not returned, two similar. So uh, similarly, that's true, so it should be returned. Null, null is not one, that should be returned. So the expected value should be, uh, the result set should be zero, two, and null. A SQLite uh, had a bug and uh, somehow null was not part of the result set. Yeah? So, so that's, a, that, that's a real SQLite bug that we have found and uh, got fixed. Okay, so that's the kind of bugs we want to find. And uh, one thing you can think of, I mean, why, I mean, there are so many database systems, right? As I showed on the sl earlier slide, and why don't we do differential testing, right? That's a simple thing. We produce a random query and produce some random data, and we'll feed this to different database management systems. And the issue here is uh, interesting, is if we do the, for, uh, send this query to these systems, and we're going to get different responses. So for Postgres, we're going to get a syntax error. MySQL, we're going to get a syntax error. SQLite, we're going to get a wrong result. So there's really nothing we can compare it to. So the reason is because uh, the different database management systems, they have a slightly different syntax and also sometimes even different uh, semantics. Okay. And uh, for example, for MySQL and Postgres uh, SQL, it requires a, a, data, a that type de definition here. And also, you know, uh, Postgres and MySQL, they provide different operators to be used here. And uh, so in a sense, the common core of a SQL core is very small. And, uh, and all the database menu systems, they have their own specific SQL dialect. And in, in particular, this uh, comment from Cockroach Labs is, we're unable to use Postgres as an Oracle because Cockroach DB has slightly different semantics and SQL support. In generating queries that execute identically on both is tricky. Okay, so I like, guess through a sequence of work that we have built this tool called SQL Lancer, and that's a uh, public available on GitHub that you can, uh, you can take a look and that has been used to solve this problem. That is, how do we find logic bugs effectively in production database management systems? So here's the basic idea. We generate a database and we generate a query and then we validate the results, right? That's what you could easily imagine. And then uh, we generate a lot of queries. And so we generate uh, like 100,000 queries for each database that we generate. And then we generate a database. We generate databases usually with small, with 30 rows also, and we repeat this process. Okay, and the first part is about how do we generate database? How do we generate query? And for that is uh, the second part is Oracle. How do we know given a query that the result is right? 
And for the first one, we did not focus too much on really just manually implement a bunch of heuristics to, uh, to generate database and queries. And the focus of us is the second part. That is, given a query, how do we know uh, a particular database management system executing this query is giving us the right result? Okay. And we have uh, developed a sequence of techniques. And the uh, first one is called PQS, Pivot Query Synthesis. And it's all try to solve the task oracle problem. Uh, for the for PQS, it generates a query, and for which it's ensure that a randomly selected row, we call that pivot row, is always fetched. So that's kind of like the uh, the basic idea behind PQS. And no rack is this idea of you know, can we imagine a scenario where, like compilers, we can have a, a setting of dash O zero that we can build in to disable all the optimizations and then we can compare to a different, do a differential testing in that way. Okay, so that's the work on no rec. And then TLP is the idea of why don't we take a listening query and partition this into, into uh, in certain ways such that uh, for this, all these partition queries, if we combine the results and the results should be guaranteed to be the same as the original query. Okay, so that's kind of like a, a set of ideas. So for this talk, I'll just focus on the first one, PQS, Pivot Query Synthesis. Uh, so the idea is we want to pick a pivot row. So for example, we pick this null row and we just want to fix on this one. We want to generate a query such that this pivot row must be within the resource set. And uh, okay, so that's our goal. That's what we want to achieve. And uh, so if, if, for example, on SQLite, and if the pivot row, for example, now here is missing from the result set, we know there's a bug, right? So that's the basic idea, okay? And, uh, and this goes through in a, in, in a few steps. The first thing is we randomly generate the database, as I mentioned, based on some heuristics. And then we pick one random row from the data that we generate as the pivot row, okay? And then we, based on the syntax of the you know, SQL language, and we generate a query like this. For example, in this case, it's a select query, select C0 from T0, and where? We're missing the, uh, the word clause. And we want to generate a predicate here such that on the pivot row, it evaluates to true, okay? And then we can use this, for example, your clauses and joins, okay? Oh. So here's how we're going to do that. And suppose we have generated this uh, condition like this here, and then we're going to evaluate this on the pivot row, okay? In our case will be this null, and then we're going to say uh, for t0 dot c0, and the value is going to be null. For one, that's going to be, we'll pass on the value of one, and then we evaluate this operator, and in this case will be true, okay? So that's how we do it, all right? So we just randomly generate a predicate, and then on the pivot row, we use the value to evaluate the predicate. If the predicate is true, then we use it. So in the case, if the predicate is not true, then we can do something quite uh, straightforward. That is, if it's true, we just use the random expression that we have generated. If it's not true, if it's false, then we use just negate the predicate we generate. If the result is null, and we use is null. Okay, so it's a very simple heuristic that we can do. So now we have generated query and we guarantee that the pivot row should be selected. And then we can validate that pivot row to make sure that is indeed it's a fetch. Also alternatively is uh, we can also say that we select a pivot row and the pivot row should not be fetched. Yeah? So that's also another alternative that we can use. And then for the check-in, final check-in is we can say we can select the value of the pivot row and intersect with the query that we have generated. Okay? And uh, if there's nothing returned, we know that uh, there's a bug in the database management system. Okay, and uh, use this uh, idea, we were able to find within a few months, uh, like uh, many bugs, and we tested these three very popular database managers, SQLite, MySQL, and uh, Postgres, and we're able to find uh, 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 close to 100 bugs, unique bugs, and uh, most of them have already been fixed. And, off, uh, and, and also, I mean, you may wonder, I mean, why do we focus a lot on SQLite? And the reason because SQLite developers are highly um, uh, responding very quickly to our bug reports. 
And uh, so here is the, you know, the technique of QQL is designed to find logical blocks. And here I want to full mention that out of these 79 blocks, uh, like uh, uh, out of the 96 blocks, uh, 61 were logical blocks, right? Most of them are logical blocks as the you know, PQS was designed to find. Okay, and also uh, we developed like other techniques like no rack and um, TLP. No rack is try to find quickly find optimization box, and TLP is try to test a wider range of uh, features in the database management systems. And PQS is the most general office and can comprehensively test the database management system core functionalities. Okay, so this uh, is uh, our testing effort so far is quite extensive. And within a year, we uh, tested a lot of data mismanagement systems. We were able to find uh, uh, more than 450 bugs and close to uh, uh, 380 were already fixed. And uh, so here's uh, also, I mean, the, the work has uh, already impacted quite a bit of uh, industry. And uh, so the adoption in industry, we're very happy with the, with the quick adoption and also uh, the warm reception to this work. And so, for example, DuckDB runs SQL Lancer R2 on every pull request that they have. And ClickHouse is a column-based uh, database management system, and also they contributed uh, their own implementation of uh, SQL Lancer. And also this MonadDB has this common says, with the help of SQL Lancer, we have been able to identify more than 100 potential problems in corner cases of the SQL processor. And uh, from TiDB, uh, PinCap also implemented uh, uh, a SQL Lancer variant in, in, uh, uh, using the Go language. So that's a, a, a quite a bit of uh, industry adoption already for the, for the work. And uh, so that's the second part of the story. That is, you know, take uh, something, uh, seems very hard, right? Take a query and then the database may contain millions of records. How do we find a, a series logical box in such a database management systems? So now let's switch here to go to the final piece of the, uh, uh, the final part of the talk that is about uh, uh, the final story, how to validate SMT solvers. Uh, so I think, I mean, to, to the audience, probably many people in the audience, SMT solvers are, uh, you may use that in your work already. And so let me just briefly mention what, what they are. So in a sense, SMT solvers take a first order logical formulas and uh, from various so-called theories, and then uh, try to decide whether the formula is certifiable or not. Okay, set or unset. So here's an example formula and uh, let's see x ranges over uh, real numbers. So x greater than zero and x less than zero. And we know this formula is unsatisfiable. And if we change the zero here to one and this formula becomes certifiable, and then we want the uh, uh, SMT solver to answer a set and also potentially give us a model that a, a solution that x equal to, for example, x equal to a half. Okay. And uh, so SMT solvers kind of like taking these sort of formulas uh, and then try to produce answer set as expected. And uh, so SMT solvers are foundational tools and we use that to build a lot of things like a symbolic execution engines. Uh, so many of you folks probably work on this domain and solver aided programming, uh, program verification certainly, and static analysis, program synthesis, and many, many things. So if we feed this formula to SMT solver, set that's expected answer. But if the SMT solver mistakenly give us its unset, and that's a bug in the SMT solver, then that means many of the tools that are based on this SMT solvers are going to falling apart. Okay, so SMT solvers, because they're so foundational, there are you know, bugs in them, the reliability of them is super critical, okay. So how do we find bugs in SMT solvers? And uh, so in a sense, is two problems. One is, so here's example formula, and uh, you just can just, you don't need to look into the details. You can just imagine that we have a very complex formula that we need to construct. So that's one hard question that we need to deal with. How do we generate, uh, you know, these formulas that is complex and sophisticated and the second thing is this check set. That is, how do we know 
that this formula should be certifiable or uncertifiable. Again, that's a test oracle problem. Two issues, right? How do we generate the formula and how do we know whether the formula is certifiable or uncertifiable? So that's two questions. So before our work, and if you look at the two most popular SMT solvers, D3 and CVC4, and uh, in the bug trackers, they actually did not have a whole lot of uh, uh, soundness bugs. Uh, so our goal was trying to find, you know, soundness bugs in SMT solvers. That is, given a formula, if it's set and the SMT solver returns unset, mistakenly. So the idea that we came up with is called semantic fusion. So it works as follows, is trying to take two formulas and try to fuse them in a way by preserving certifiability. And then uh, the goal is try to find the soundness bugs in state of art SMT solvers. And uh, so I mean, within a few months, we're able to find uh, about 30 also critical soundness bugs in this ring CVC4. So that was uh, pretty much the first uh, extensive uh, a testing effort for, for a successful testing effort for, for SMT solve, modern SMT solvers. So let me illustrate the idea. That is, we're taking two formulas, uh, five one and five two, and uh, we somehow fuse them. First of all, we just concatenate the formula, and then we try to connect the formulas in an interesting way so that we will preserve certifiability of original formulas. So let me illustrate. Uh, we take two formulas, five one and five two. And uh, so both are certifiable. And then we concatenate them together and uh, we, uh, via a conjunction, okay? And this formula is also certifiable. So that's the concatenation. We're just putting these two formulas, concatenate them together, doing nothing fancy. And uh, to see that, I mean, the formula is still certifiable is we can just, you know, let x equal to two, y equal to minus two. And here I want to stress that uh, the variable says for the two formulas are disjoint. Let's assume they're disjoint. And uh, so the idea for semantic fusion is the following. And let's take two uh, variable instances, one from the first formula, another from the second formula. And let's try to create this uh, uh, a new variable called Z, fresh variable Z. And through this uh, combination, let's say just use example, Z is equal to X plus Y. And I, and we call that the fusion function. And then with the fusion function, we'll be able to derive the original X and Y and through the following way, that is, you know, X can be get from Z and Y by Z minus Y and similarly for Y, we can get Y is equal to Z minus X. And we call this the inversion functions. So fusion function and inversion functions. And take the inversion functions, we plug them in back into the original formula by replace the occurrence of X by Z minus one, okay? And now we have the fuse formula and it's guaranteed that the fuse formula is still certifiable. And why you say, why do we combine this? And the thing is we want to have an interesting combination of these two formulas, phi one and phi two through this variable Z. And this set, so the concatenation set and then uh, be, uh, we view this, we can induce also a, 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 a certified assignment for the fuse formula by letting Z is equal to X plus Y, and that's going to be zero, okay? So now what we have done is a very simple idea. Take two formulas that are known to be set, and then we fuse them in this way to produce this fuse formula. And this fuse formula could be used to stress test estimate solvers. So if a solver says this onset, we know a bug for sure has happened, okay? So let me illustrate a bit more concretely using two cases. So here is, uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a set formula. So that's phi one, that's phi two. And then we just combine them together. That's a concatenation. We are putting all the declarations above and all the assertions, the predicates below. And then we find two instances, X and Y. And then we fuse them, uh, and we produce a Z. So that's a fresh variable that we create. And then we use this fusion function and we multiply them together, X times Y. Okay, and then the inversion functions will be the using the div, division. Okay, now we have this formula. That's a fuse formula we have produced and they should be guaranteed to be set, okay, by our construction. But CVC4 is uh, one of the uh, major uh, SMT solvers and on this example, fuse formula, it says onset and that discovered a bug in 
in, in CVC4, okay? And that's a real bug that we have reported to CVC4 got fixed. And also if the two formulas are on set, we can uh, do you know, a very similar process. I'm not to give you the details. And uh, so in a sense, we just take them, we produce this also fuse formula, okay? And then we can feed this a solver. If the solver says it's set, then that's a mistake. And then that's a bug in the solver. Okay, and then you can illustrate on this uh, formula. So that's uh, this onset, this onset, and then we can produce this fuse formula and here discovers a bug in V3, okay? Because the expected answer should be onset. All right. Okay, so here are we, uh, a, a few bugs that we have found. So in this case, the bug in V3, uh, and uh, so that's uh, uh, the main developer, main maintainer of, uh, of uh, V3. And this is a bug in uh, CVC4 and uh, should be set and reports unset, okay? And this is a, a label that is a major bug in, in, in CVC4. And this is a bug in V3. And uh, this is interesting. It says it's a, because of incomplete uh, excrementization of uh, string to integer, and then also expose more opportunities for rewriting. Okay. And this is a bug in CVC4. And again, it's labeled as a, as a major bug in CVC4. And this is a bug in, in, in Z3. And uh, this one is interesting uh, in the sense that the unreduced formula we produced is triggered bug in both Z3 and CVC4. And this illustrates purely doing differential testing may not be sufficient. And uh, so that's uh, about semantic fusion. And then here's an, uh, a follow-up idea, very simple, even simpler than semantic fusion that we follow. That is in the formula that we have, we have a lot of operators. So we can try to, in this case, the formula CVC4 and Z3 both says it's certifiable and both correctly. And then we can take the operator and try to replace that by some other operators to kind of like change the semantic meaning of the formula. So in this case, we know the, uh, you know, we're doing comparisons um, between two integers. So that means for integer predicates, we have a few choices and we have you know, all these choices and we can randomly replace this by something else. In this case, we replace the distinct by equality and we produce this formula here. And we feed this to the solvers and we trigger a bug in CVC4, okay? And that's, uh, uh, we, tri we, tr we trigger a bug in, in these three. So these three should be, uh, should be unset, but these three are mistaken report set. And then we can chain this process by doing these mutations. And this here illustrates the chain also finds a bug here in Z3 again, okay? So that's a very simple idea and was uh, called uh, doing type aware operator mutations. And uh, with this idea, so this is the first one based on semantic fusion. And uh, so we're able to find uh, close to 30 bugs, soundless bugs in Z3 and CVC4. And this simple idea turns out to be very effective and find a lot of bugs, about 200 bugs, soundless bugs in, C, in this region, Z, CVC4. And altogether, so after one year of effort, extensive effort, we reported more than a thousand bugs in this region, CVC4, and more than 700 have been fixed. And the tool is public available on GitHub and you can play with it. Okay, so that's the final piece of story. And that is in how do we, uh, come up with uh, simple, general, and principal ideas how to test critical software foundations. And let me co come back to this picture here, that uh, in the software foundations are very important. We touch upon a few things, compilers, databases, and theorem provers, okay? And there are some eff other effort touch upon uh, open SSL and various other things. Okay, so here is, I want to us to step back a bit and then re re reflect a little. So, our pioneers in the about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, had this uh, worry that the software, the software crisis. So, and I will change this a bit. I will say that actually we have this, the software crisis, uh, the biggest issue is the, spec, the specification crisis. And all the piece of work I mentioned is try to tackle this issue, the specification crisis. And again, let's think about this. The mission of uh, computer science, as I argue, is try to help people turn their creative ideas into working systems. And working, you know, what does working mean? Working means that means we have a property of the system, right? So that is, we have a proof, we have a system we have built. We want to make sure that the system satisfies the specification, the property. 
but the issue is where you know does this uh, property or specification come from and uh, so there's a dilemma here and i argue that the lack of specification is one of the greatest challenges that we face and actually one of the greatest uh, practical and technical challenges we face in our field okay and the three stories i mentioned is really try to pr provide certain perspectives try to tackle this particular issue the lack of specifications and uh, so the problem is very difficult and i don't see that there's going to be a, a uniform solution that's going to help anything but i believe the right direction to take is having this nice human and machine collaboration right something can be easily discovered by machines and something should be told by the humans, by the developers or programmers. Right? So I think we should explore this particular direction and put more effort into this here. That is, how do we find the right balance between human and machine collaboration? And what I discussed uh, so far is I want to thank, you know, it's like all the, uh, uh, you know, great people who are behind this work and uh, both, uh, you know, students and uh, postdocs from back at Davis and also uh, students and postdoc at, at ETH and also want to thank for the support from ETH from the US National Science Foundation and also general support from Google as well for the work that I have described. And now let's just uh, summarize. So what are the takeaways? I mentioned a lot of things. What are the main takeaways? So first thing I want to say that I want to impress on everyone that software foundations are critical. Okay, and I hope I uh, uh, you know, get that message across. And the second thing is a general principle work can help solidify this, you know, critical software foundations, right? By finding in, in our case, through these three little stories, we have found more than a few thousand bugs in the most critical software systems that we use. And, uh, and also, as I just argued, the specific crisis is a key challenge for us to try to tackle and find solutions to work. And the final thing is I want to stress that in our research, we ought to build tools we love to use ourselves, right? Many times is, you know, we do a piece of research, we publish a paper, even if we put the tool on GitHub, right? We just forget about it. I think uh, that's probably not the best use of our effort. And if we're true, we truly believe that we, as a developers of tool, should really love to use the tools, right? We have confidence in the tools, we should want to refine and build upon the tools so that we can use ourselves. Right. So in a sense, you should not just, you know, put the tools on GitHub to say somebody is going to find good use of the tools, right? We should really keep continuing building, refining, and maintaining the tools ourselves. Okay, so with that, I want to thank for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions. I think we have some time for that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Su, for the uh, inspiring talk. I think it is really, really uh, interesting to see this uh, simple but effective technique working in different domains. Uh, let's see, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I think you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask directly, or you can type in the chat uh, box. Okay. Sh should I stop sharing? Uh, no, I think it's okay. I think we, uh, it's okay. I think, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. This slide. Yeah. Okay, let me leave on this slide here. Uh, hello, Prof. Su. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, this is Yuakang from NTU, and, and thank you for your great talk today. And uh, you have done some great work on finding bugs in compilers. Um, but uh, what about interpreters? There are some languages that are interpreted, uh, like Python or JavaScript. Um, can we still use the same methodologies uh, for fi uh, to to find? bugs for interpreters or does uh, interpreters pose any new challenges? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we, we have actually done some work on uh, finding bugs in interpreters, in particular virtual machines, JVMs, Java virtual machines. And uh, so there's a, a set of work, and together was great work by, by Yu Ting Chen from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. He spent some time at Davis and did some work. We right? were able to find uh, I think about uh, some pretty serious issues also in, in hotspot uh, GVM. And uh, in terms of uh, general interpreters, uh, there has been a lot of work on finding bugs in like uh, JavaScript interpreters, right? So I think the work by a master student of Andrea Seller, and they were able to find more than a thousand bugs in, the, in some of the widely used JavaScript interpreters. 
And the, in the second part of your question, whether the ideas I presented will be able to applicable and uh, depends. So if the interpreter is really just simply interpret the piece of code, then because I mean the EMI is based on also running the program on a single input. So that's not directly applicable. And uh, the setting that EMI is mostly applicable is where the compiler is doing static compilation, right? It's doing a lot of like a, like a static analysis and optimization behind the hood and try to optimize the code, right? If it's interpreters and the way that you, uh, you can use is try to uh, maybe build oracles in a different way, yeah? So, and or do, you know, do differential testing if that scenario is applicable. So thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. Hi, Zhendong Jinsong here. I just look at you, uh, a specification crisis is a kind of a key challenge. Um, I just wondering what's your um, advice or point to the research direction for the formal specification community. You know, there's a state-based, uh, event-based calculus. Um, there, there, there's a quite, a, quite a bit of research work um, on formal specification. Um, do you have any advice for the for the for the research direction and how to how to channel their research to make a connection with uh, with uh, with the quality software? I see. Uh, thanks, Jason, for the for, for the great question. You know, I, I don't really. I mean, I pose this, I guess, as a as a, as a significant challenge for our whole community. I mean, I don't have good answers besides, uh, I think the right direction is that we want to try to combine what is easy for us as humans to express and also what can be automatically inferred by through, you know, algorithmic approaches or machine learning or deep learning. And uh, I guess beyond that, it's uh, a really a problem, uh, I guess a problem domain specific, right? So, so for the domains that I have mentioned here, uh, in a sense, I think there are, there are the domains are very amendable to come up with the generic oracles for, for doing this testing. There are some domains in particular, you know, if we take a, a general C and C++ programs and want to say, you know, how can you come up with a general method and you'll be able to infer specifications out of this? And I think that's extremely hard. And uh, we have done some work in, in, uh, in recent months on how to do so for mobile apps, for Android apps. But uh, beyond that, I think it's a very difficult problem. And, uh, and I don't really have a, have a good answer, insightful answer there. Thank you, Zhendong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor, I just have a follow-up question really regarding this uh, specification yeah. is that um, will you do this EMI or this uh, uh, Query generation. Um, do we have a, a kind of metrics to evaluate the diversity of different um, uh, uh, test cases? So, in the way that you know how much has been covered and what are the 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 the, the, the next kind of uh, direction or new steps we need to take into. Yes. That, that, you know, thanks, John, for, for for that very nice question. Yes, we have considered this a little bit, not so much as I had hoped. And uh, so in the EMI, the first piece of work called Orion, right? And the second work was published in Uppsala 2015. And that's where we consider this notion of diversity, right? When we're doing this uh, variant generation, we want to generate a new variant, somehow that looks more different compared to the previous one. We use uh, like MCMC -MC sampling ideas to have some sort of uh, fitness function to guide the search. And uh, that didn't help us very much. I mean, I think it's probably, uh, one reason is because of the setting and the other reason is probably because we did not find the uh, perfect way to do it. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting direction to explore. There are many things along this you can explore. For example, even the EMI setting and where to do the deletion during the insertion and what to insert and delete are just purely at random, right? There's no intelligence at all. And you can imagine that that can be much more guided, right? To find the suitable locations to perform these kind of mutations and also what sort of mutation to take. I think there will be a lot of uh, additional things that we can do, so, so yes. certainly. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I think this is exactly the things I'm thinking. I think this is a very, very interesting mm -hmm. thing to 
think it was more right. kind of a high level meta model level kind of understanding about the whole process, right? Of all the testing. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. There, there, there's a balance though. That is, I mean, the uh, doing something randomly, although it uh, seems unintelligent, but on the other hand, it's very cheap, right? That's why random testing is very effective. So if you try to add in more and more intelligence, that means the time it takes to produce a variant also becomes longer. Right. right, so there's a balance right. yeah. that you have to carefully uh, consider. Yeah. You're right, you're right, yeah. Uh, I think due to time limit, uh, any last uh, question? Uh, hi, Prof. Su. Uh, yeah, I, uh, thanks for your great work about testing the, the, the compiler. And um, I want to know your opinion about the, the, the your, your opinion about the mm, run, uh, run, because some languages has also also has the uh, runtime uh, libraries they can uh, as they can they can manage the, uh, the the they can help the programmers code they can provide some context they can do some management things uh, but I hardly heard the uh, bugs about them from um, from the community so uh, I want to know your um, opinion or advices about this. Uh, so what sort of measurements? I think I did not catch the first part of your question. Could you? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, some languages, uh, they also come up with some runtime packages. These runtime packages can, uh, can be um, part of the, uh, part of the, after the compilation, they might be part of the base code uh, to run these kind of languages. Like Java, they have the uh, garbage collection. Uh, like a Go, they have the the function that they provide. Oh, I the, see. I understand. Yeah. So you're so you're talking about the runtime support, runtime systems, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. I see. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. So I guess in mo most of our work is we treat the compilers, we treat all the systems as black boxes. And you could also do the same thing, right? Even if you're a garbage collector, even if you have runtime support, you just treat this as a whole package of this uh, you know, software system. You know? So in a sense, I think the ideas will still be applicable there. But on the other hand, if you want to say, uh, it, you know, if uh, it, it might be beneficial to consider like, a, you know, how to test a garbage collector, right? How to take a, you know, particular runtime support for certain things in a separate, uh, you know, separately, right? More specifically, I think that'll be very interesting. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. I think there, I think there are overwhelming questions that, uh, uh, I don't have time to go through them one by one. Uh, so any, anyway, let's uh, assess uh, Prof. Su once again for the wonderful talk and the answers to the, the questions. And uh, we hope we really can uh, have you physically uh, in the future so that we can exchange the ideas further. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again. And thanks for a lot for your attention and hope we all can freely travel again, right? To meet each other in person, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Have a yeah, have a great rest of the conference. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for staying with us and uh, see you in the later sessions. Okay, bye.